Hi, everyone. It's really nice that you can all join us here today. We're having a one of an interesting discussion, which is reporting effectively to the board. This is just as a reminder, it's a lead dev uh, webinar. It's, it's a partnership with Code Climate. A couple of quick logistic questions, and then we'll get to the meat of the conversation. Is One is like, this will be about 45 minutes. And after that, me and the panelists will all head to the slide. I like when I say head to, it, it, I want I want to feel like we're going somewhere, but no, we're just going to open another Slack window thanks to the, the, the remote world we're living in. But we'll head over to the lead the Slack channel, answer questions in the process channel. We'll have some time to uh, answer a couple of questions. I'll keep an eye on it and, and you know definitely weave that into the conversation. Um, but we'll we'll try to make sure that we answer the questions that we've heard from the panelists. So there, so um, that's it. Well, let's get started with some introductions. I'll be I'm the moderator today. My name is Pooja Brown, um, and I am joined by two of our esteemed panelists today. Unfortunately, we had a third panelist, uh, Anand, who was who was not able to make it today. But I can tell you, we will you will have a very robust and interesting conversation. So with that, I'll start with you, Shah. I'd love um, if you can introduce yourself to uh, to our folks today. Yeah, thank you, Pooja. Um, my name is Shah Ma. Um, I'm currently Vice President and Head of Engineering at Catalyst Software. Um, I started the role in December of 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and we're a B2B SaaS customer success platform. Um, prior to Catalyst, um, I was with GitHub. I was VP of engineering there, responsible for our core platform, ecosystem, and community teams. So across about 150 people. Um, and then prior to GitHub, um, I spent about four years as VP of engineering at SendGrid, um, you know, definitely on the email transactional side of things. Um, and then as well as, you know, bring our second line of business marketing campaigns um, to production. Um, and then there I was part of the leadership team that took the company public in 2017. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I'm dialing in today from beautiful Boulder, Colorado. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you, Sean. And I really like as you walk through your history, right, there's so many varying stages of companies that you're in. So I think it will be interesting to see the insights at every stage of how how the board plays, uh, play, uh, you know, uh, plays into it into the stages of the company. Um, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Pooja. Uh, my name is Brian Helmkamp, and I am the CEO and founder of Code Climate. Um, in terms of my background, uh, I have been an engineer um, my whole career, in essence. Uh, and prior to Code Climate, I was most recently a CTO. Um, and then when I founded Code Climate, I kind of moved into that uh, founder uh, CEO role, which I've been in um, since. So uh, I suppose relative to this conversation, I've been uh, hosting and facilitating and preparing for, for board meetings for the last eight years or so. Um, at Code Climate in particular, uh, one of our core focuses is actually helping engineering leaders to use data to better understand and improve their organizations. Um, and also, as a big part of that, it's really helping them communicate more effectively with their senior leadership peers, their CEOs, um, and really their boards. Uh, and um, we find that if those conversations can come from a, a shared fact-based understanding, that makes things better for everybody, and, and reporting is a big part of that. So I'm very excited to be here um, talking today uh, with Shah and Pooja, and I'm dialing in from New York City. Thanks, Brian. I forgot to mention I'm dialing in from San Francisco, so I think we have good coverage across the United States today. Um, well, you know, I'm, I love the fact that we have a CEO uh, and a VP of engineering, but, you know, we're all amongst probably most of you are engineering leaders, right, who have been exposed or heard of the board, sat on a board, want to be on a board you know, have been summoned by the boards, probably various stages of interactions with the board. So maybe I'll start with a question and Shah, I'll start with you and, you know, feel free, uh, Brian, as you see fit to chime in. But, you know, 
let's talk about like what is the role of the board right because like what does a board do in the governance of an organization and how do you as a technology leader see that role come through yeah absolutely i think ultimately the role of the board is to work with an executive team for a company to set strategy and direction for the company um, and I think they're also there to help ensure there's accountability from an execution perspective um, towards making sure that you're doing the right things um, for the success of the company and for the shareholders. Um, so I think a lot of the boards that, um, especially in kind of earlier stage pre-IPO companies, are essentially your early investors, right? So our board is made up of our, you know, series seed, series A and series B um, investors, and they all bring um, kind of their own outside and independent perspective um, based on their personal experiences uh, to the table. So um, a lot of our interactions with the board range anywhere from, you know, kind of asking them for help, um, establishing a relationship um, and asking them for help on various things to kind of really talking about um, industry trends that they're seeing um, with kind of current macroeconomic conditions, how that's impacted, you know, the funding landscape um, to um, what are some of the learnings and patterns that they're seeing with similar stage companies um, that they that are also in their portfolio. So um, as an example, um, one of our recent um, interactions with the board was um, one of our board members helped us navigate a very complex matrix organization um, that had many stakeholders, uh, many decision makers, and what went recently uh, through like an acquisition by a Fortune 500 company. Um, and we just needed someone that's a decision maker um, to kind of really help uh, make the sell of our product. And they were able to kind of help us navigate that to get to the right person. So um, in, in essence, you know, your board is there to help you, right? And so don't, don't be afraid to kind of um, ask them for help um, because they're there to lean in and support you and act as kind of another resource that you can leverage. You know, uh, Brian, from a CEO's perspective, right, is that, you know, I'd love to know, you know, how, you know, how do you or the company actually leverage the board effectively? Like, I think the examples Shah said were great, right? It's like they can help you do sales, they can help you navigate some sticky situations, right? But there's also, you know, from a CEO's perspective, there are things that you expect from the board and I'm sure you're, the company as well. So like, what does that look like? Yeah, for sure. So I think in order to get the most out of your board, it's kind of like um, you, you sort of can get back as much as you put into it, right? So I think sometimes um, maybe you have folks, depending on what their priorities are, they might feel like, you know what, I just don't have time to, to kind of really engage all that much. Um, and then you're, you're not sort of going to be able to get as much um, out of it. So I would say one of the things that's first important to do is, well, choose your board members wisely. And there's probably a whole nother webinar on that because sure, uh, yes. they're, very, <laughs> they're very hard to change uh, once they're there. Uh, but if you've got the right board, then you want to sort of make sure that they have an ongoing understanding of the challenges that the business is facing, uh, which is in and of itself a bit tricky because these people are often very busy, right? So um, you need to figure out ways to package information so that it's digestible um, and with a, um, you know, a limited amount of time investment on the part of your board members, they can really sort of get up on processing what's going on and then be able to help most effectively. Um, and so the board meeting, sometimes those are often quarterly, is one vehicle for that. Um, but oftentimes by sharing information, for example, quick email updates like outside of the board meeting or even, you know, I actually do, um, you know, one to one phone calls with my board members at least once a month um, that helps them sort of know what's going on, because if you're in a high growth startup and you're doing quarterly board meetings, so much changes in 90 days that you could spend probably the whole board meeting just explaining everything that's different relative to the previous time. And then you're out of time and you didn't get any help. Um, so you need to kind of figure out what's the information to distribute. And then there's a lot that you can get back from that in terms of some of the, the items that, that Shaw mentioned. Um, the operational advice, I think mentorship is a key part. Um, I am very grateful for the just professional development and mentorship that I've been able to get um, from our investors at Code Climate that helped me to grow into being a better entrepreneur, um, executive leader and, and CEO. 
Um, and then one, and then I would say um, the the last two parts are you know taking advantage of their networks uh, because often these people have a very broad network of folks that can be helpful to you, um, and you can get an introduction to somebody. Oh, they actually I know somebody at my, another portfolio company of mine. They just went through that problem, and, and they maybe they'd be happy to talk to you. So if you get generate the understanding, then you can put them to work. And really, the board members, the good ones, will want to be put to work um, for you, but they won't necessarily know what to do and run off and do on their own unless you kind of put it directly in front of them. Yeah, um, you know, the quarterly board meetings, right? The sort of like that brings back so many memories, right? It's just sort of like not memories in terms of like, you know, everyone's sort of, and maybe both of you have been, you know, involved in like the, the deck that gets prepared for the board, right? To some extent, right? Irrespective of what the ad hoc communications is, the formality of it is, quarter you know typically on a quarterly basis you're having a board meeting and there is a deck that is prepared that is giving a snapshot of the company in some manner um you know and i'd love to know from both of your experiences right it's like what's typical in those decks and what are and also not just that what what do we think that we should also be adding right because uh, i feel like we, i'm sure when you prep for those decks there are gaps in there that you're like man like i wish we could spend more time on this part and, and educate the board yet the template didn't have it so uh i'll start with you shy it's like sort of like what are what are typical things that a board reviews at a quarterly cadence yeah i think it really depends on kind of the state of the business the company um but i think the key thing to keep in mind um i think brian uh, mentioned this as well is that the board is very busy um, every quarter you have, you know, kind of a couple hours dedicated time um, through this meeting. Um, it's not always, you know, just a reporting up, right? Like if you were to do it presentation style, um, that takes up the entire time and you're not getting any value out of that interaction. So really um, the way that we tend to structure our board meeting is that, you know, every department really kind of brings to the table, like, you know, obviously there's updates, but keep it short. Um, so you can talk a little bit about the wins um, and the changes since the last board meeting. Um, but we also talk about what keeps up uh, what keeps us up at night. So what are some of the most pressing things that's top of mind for us? Um, and use that as kind of a launch board to start generating more deep dive discussions um, around key topics. So we can start talking about making some of those key decisions that really require board input. Um, things like you know strategy decisions around pricing and packaging, data, um, how we invest from an architecture perspective, looking at our KPIs um, in terms of like, do we focus on growth? Do we focus more on efficiencies? If we were to make some priority trade-offs um, from a roadmap perspective, where do we make those trade-offs and where should we focus our attention on? Um, and then we usually kind of end with um, what can the board help you with? So um, kind of a list of our asks for the board um, so that they have action items and takeaways. Um, that they can then take back and follow up with us, you know, for the remainder of the, the you know, before our next meeting. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I would say like in terms of the presentation, it could be qualitative or quantitative, um, but at the end of the day, you know, um, you should be clear about kind of the outcome, like what are you looking to kind of get across um, to the board in terms of updates and what are you expecting in terms of um, action items and um, discussion points. Got it. Um, you know, my in general, right, is like we're all working for technology SaaS companies, right? And usually the board's makeup is not is is from different departments, different walks of life, right? So not not necessarily technology, could be marketing, could be finance, could be account, you know, you name it, right? Because you're trying to um, have a have a full representation. And it's interesting, Shah, that you brought up like architecture and technology. You know, maybe this is a question, Brian, this might be a question for you is like, like, do you think that there is like, have you seen enough technology representation in those decks? And like, where's the opportunity? Because my experience has always been like, we get one little box in the, on, on a slide, right? And if a hundred page slide, you get one page that usually they're out like resources and headcount and maybe a couple of big updates. So I'd, I'd love to know, like, you know, from your perspective, what is data that you think the board should know more about the engineering organization? 
Yeah, it's it's a great uh, question, Pooja. And I feel like that is a pretty common affliction, uh, despite the fact that the software engineering group is building all of this technology and innovation and R&D, which is ultimately what everybody around the table believes is going to you know, power these companies to their, their growth goals and their, um, their future profits. It's also very expensive, right? Like, you know, for, for many companies, by the time their engineering headcount is maybe something like, you know, 75 people or so, they're spending in excess of $10 million a year on engineering. Um, and then you, you're exactly right. You have a hundred, you know, slide deck and it's like, okay, 30 slides on sales and 30 on marketing. And then it's just like, okay, so engineering is, um, you know, it's still here. They're still doing things like, in, unless something's broken and then it's, you know, then it's like, okay, now <laughs> we need to have, focus. we're going to yes. have, you know, five slides about why everything's late or why the website is down and that type of thing. Right. So, um, I think that engineering really has an opportunity to um, increase our seat at the table by holding ourselves to the same um, sort of standards in terms of the way that we communicate with our boards that other parts of an organization do. And if you look around that boardroom, you see that really every group, sales, marketing, even HR, which is a super people oriented function, they come with data driven insights. And it doesn't mean that everything is represented in the quantitative data, but there's a quantitative basis of understanding. Um, and then there is a qualitative discussion um, on top of that. So from an engineering standpoint, you know, it's going to vary depending on your stage, depending on your goals. Um, are you focused entirely on, let's say, building an initial new product and innovation? The information to convey around that's going to be pretty different than if you're at a situation where it's a mature product and you're focused on scaling up more, uh, supporting more customers while keeping things um, maintained and, and up. Um, but there's a lot more that you can do, I would say, than just reporting on um, the, the sort of the basics. I think everyone tends to get to is we have this much headcount and we have these maybe these deliverables which are coming up right and these are or these are the deliverables that we just shipped and that's like the very basic piece um i would recommend that if you are looking to go a little bit further than that and actually sort of be able to to kind of go uh into that discussion of engineering strategy um being able to talk about how many coders you have as a as a refinement relative to just how much headcount uh, because sometimes what we see in organizations is maybe they doubled the size of their engineering org, but they actually only have 20% more people actually writing code. Um, and that doesn't mean that the only thing we do in engineering is writing code, but it can be the case that sometimes you, there's just layers and layers of, of sort of overhead and management and um, that this kind of uh, get absorbed in an organization over time that make it difficult to get the sort of the full benefit of that increased um, headcount coming out of it. So, so that's one thing, just like going the next level on the organization with the coders, maybe looking at ramp time or people not just being hired, but are they able to be effective quickly? And then depending on stage, you can consider if it makes sense to add anything around, for example, efficiency or productivity, how quickly is code able to make it out to production? And then quality is always going to be kind of dependent on on stage right at the beginning, maybe incidents uptime escalations are not at all relevant. But as you get bigger and are supporting a larger footprint um, in a variety of different ways, then, you know, can you help the board understand what the impact of needing to support all that footprint is and how maybe now actually you have to devote 17 engineers just to to kind of keep everything, keep the lights on across the board. And then how is that impacting your organization's ability to deliver innovation? Those are the types of conversations that can be had, I think, at the board level, but only if that that data is is sort of been provided in a way that's understandable um, to, to sort of set the frame. Yeah, and, and I think to add to that, I think also keep in mind that each board meeting is expected to be somewhat different. Like you're not always covering the same metrics and the same data all the time. It depends on kind of you know, where you are as a company, what's most pressing, um, and what problems you're looking to solve right now. And so, for example, um, my first board meeting that I attended at Catalyst was very different than the subsequent meetings. Um, the first board meeting, um, I think the board cared a lot 
um, from, um, you know, my perspective in terms of what are some of your first like 30, 60, 90 day observations? Um, what are some of your findings and recommendations around people, product processes? Where are the gaps? And what are your recommendations in terms of what we're going to do about it, right? Like what are our strengths, weaknesses, areas of opportunities, um, and what plans or engineering strategy you're looking to put in place um, to kind of help fill that gaps, fill, fill those different gaps. Um, so I think that was an interesting uh, use case. Um, additionally, I think um, to uh, to just add to what Brian was uh, talking about in terms of different stages of the company. Um, as an engineering leader, you also have to think about that mind shift um, between different stages. So for example, um, 2020, so before I joined um, Catalyst, it was very much about series A stage. It's about getting to product market fit. And so there's a set of things around like, how do we know? What are some of the indicators that we're at product market fit? Um, and then when I joined in December of 2020, um, we went through a, a significant growth phase because Series B is all about focused on growth, right? So how fast are we growing? We went, we quadrupled in our traffic and our revenue, and then we tripled and we're on track to triple again. So what does that look like um, from, you know, kind of keeping up with our customers and not blocking the business? Because at that stage of the company, you don't want engineering to be the reason <laughs> where like, oh, we can't sell to this next customer. We can't go up market or we can't do this um, because there are engineering system limitations. Um, and so so now that we're uh, in the midst of our B and we're looking kind of ahead at our you know, next round of funding, which is Series C, um, we're starting to think a lot more about how do we transition from growth um, to efficiency um, as we look at kind of that next level of metrics around gross margins and COGS and engineering plays a huge role in that. So again, as an example, one of my recent presentations to the board was really around kind of um, that technology strategy in terms of where do we spend from an architecture perspective uh, along each stages. So again, going into product market fit, you don't really need to kind of over-engineer or over-architect, right? It's all about kind of getting the features in front of your customers, getting that those signals and feedback around like, hey, you know, people are buying our product. They're really interested um, in the pain point that we're solving. Um, but, you know, kind of um, Series B, as I mentioned, the primary objective is that we're not blocking sales. Um, and so in 2021, we went out with more of a horizontal scaling approach in that, you know, we're like, hey, you know, the existing architecture, it, it is what it is. Um, we're growing very fast. Our growth can cover most of our expenses at this scale. Um, and so therefore we're just replicating our current cluster to support as many customers as we can onboard. Um, and that way we just built a simple routing layer and we're like, hey, if you're a customer one through 100, you're on this cluster. If you're like the next 100 customers, you're on the second cluster and so on and so forth, right? but you can't continue that trajectory forever and grow your um, engineering costs and expenses linearly, like all of our costs are in the cloud. And we can't you know, support that if um, we don't have um, you know, a very solid data foundation. And so that's why this year we're starting to look at that and we're saying, hey, how can we spend our money more smarter than just stamping out these clusters? And how do we actually start looking under the cover, under the hood um, and make some of those replacement, right? Like maybe dumping all of our data into a managed Postgres cluster is very expensive. So how do we start introducing like data lake architectures and data warehouses where it's much more cost efficient to st store like large amounts of data, especially trends data or historical historical data that, you know, uh, because we're building all these trend reports around customer health, right? Like how, how do we store that and query on that more efficiently? And how does that then impact um, our cost of goods sold from a COGS perspective, which then leads to better looking gross margins um, as we start thinking about Series C and efficiency. Yeah, so tying it all together. Absolutely, <laughs> in, in, very helpful, yeah. Um, Brian, I'm sure, you know, as you hire more executives in your team, right, and like you were probably uh, introducing them to the board, right? And like, this is maybe a twofold question is like, sort of how, like, how do you train executives to be a part of your, your board meeting, right? And then like, you know, what does your first board meeting look like? Uh, and then, you know, the second question in my mind is like, you know, how do you actually build relationship with the board? Right. Even the, they're such busy folks. Right. Uh, even though they've agreed to spend time, you know, you're always wary of how much time you're taking off of their table and like how, how effective that relationship is. So, you know, love to know how, how you introduce people to the board. 
Yeah, happy to, to start there and get the ball rolling on, on that piece. Um, so yeah, I would think um, if you are in a position of being a new executive who's going to have you know board level relationships, maybe attend board meetings, at Code Climate, our executives actually attend pretty much the whole board meeting except for closed session. So I know in some orgs, they might have people step in and then step out. We actually have pretty much everybody there the whole time. Um, but uh, the first time is probably the most scary time um, and it, very important that that first showing. Uh, so one of the things I would recommend is uh, is cheat. Uh, that is to say, um, talk to each of the board members before the first board meeting. Um, so that when you walk into that first board meeting, it's not the first time that you've seen these people. Um, and generally, um, that is super helpful. It can just be a 15 minute conversation. I just want to introduce myself um, and, you know, give them a little bit of uh, the excitement for why you joined and just start that, you know, um, uh, relationship from from that standpoint. And you can also get a feel for what those board members are like, because every board member is different and every board is different. Um, you know, sometimes I have, uh, you might have an executive joining an organization and they're, um, you know, they're worried about like, oh my gosh, is, is you know, is this a, a uh, are people going to be, you know, yelling and pounding the table during the board meeting about where's the, you know, where's the revenue growth or the, you know, the, the EBITDA uh, margin. And when I hear something like that, I'm imagining like, okay, this probably happened at a company that this, you know, this person previously worked at. Fortunately, that is not, you know, how our board meetings um, tend to go. Um, so I think it's important to talk to your CEO and get a feel for what are board meetings like at your company? What are the different personalities of the board members who are going to be there? Your CEO can probably tell you, hey, this person's actually pretty quiet. But when they ask a question, you know, you're, we really want to pay attention to it, right? Or like this person's not even going to say very much, but they're going to, you know, call me up afterwards. And then we're going to have like some really good conversation or like this person loves they were an engineer, they love product and engineering. And so just expect that they are going to want to talk, you know, uh, about everything, including your database sharding strategy, because they, they, you know, they know that stuff through and through. So um, I would say get a feel for that, you'll get a feel for where the company stands, right? Um, is the company going through a period of strain, where there are difficult conversations or potential stressors that might come out that might have nothing to do with engineering at all, but are going to be maybe front of mind for people for that first board meeting or is it a different context and so just try to collect as much information um, as you can going in to, to sort of prepare yourself and I think you can get it from a few different ways. Um, Shah, did, uh, any any thoughts uh, you want to add on this sort of like first first showing piece from the that <laughs> your standpoint? Yeah, so I think sometimes the relationship actually even starts before you start at the company, because I know we leverage our board members a lot when it comes to closing, like, yeah, you know, key absolutely. executives right. and senior <laughs> roles. So before yeah. I started at Catalyst, I spoke to two of our board members um, to kind of pick their brains about like, hey, why did you invest in this company and what did you see? Um, and kind of got from their perspective, some of their investment thesis around like, hey, we've been looking at company in this space for a while and we really believe there's, you know, a huge opportunity here. So kind of understanding how they're thinking about um, kind of the potential um, for the business from their perspective was super valuable. Um, and so, you know, so I felt really good about joining the company and having access to the board because even before I started the company, I felt like um, there were opportunities for me to kind of pick their brains and, and learn a little bit more. Um, additionally, I think, especially in like kind of series ABC stage companies, I feel like the board really wants to work for you and wants to help yeah. out because they um, invested money in you. They want to see the company to be successful. And at the end of the day, you know, I think by involving them in different activities, it actually um, helps to build buy-in as well as engagement from your board members. So we've tapped our board members anywhere from like, hey, look, you know, everyone is shifting towards this remote first um, culture. So what does that look like from a salary perspective? Like, can we get rid of our geo bands and just kind of pay everyone at tier one salary, right? And so having those type of conversations with our board and getting their input um, and thoughts. Um, additionally, we actually invite our board members to do, so for every kind of um, company like level get together. So like we'll, during our um, annual kickoff this year, um, we invited our board member, two of our board members to do like a fireside chat um, for the entire company where, you know, we had a moderator, they asked them questions and kind of their perspectives on, 
um, you know, again, you know, why they invested in us and, you know, what are some of the challenges they're expecting us to face going through this growth stage? What are they seeing in like similar, um, like uh, stage portfolio companies um, and things like that? Um, and then recently um, we had a, our first conference. Um, it's bringing customer success to the center summit. Um, and we actually in, uh, in, invited Voss um, from Excel, who's our lead uh, investor and one of our board members to give a keynote um, to talk about kind of the, uh, the most important metrics um, from a board perspective when it comes to customers. Um, and he kind of really brought forth that like NRR and DR, so like looking at churn, net revenue retention is now becoming a very key metric um, in boardroom settings. And really then tying that back to our product marketing message, right? Or our marketing message around, you know, how Catalyst as a tool is all about kind of aggregating all these different sources of data and helping you understand the overall customer health so that you have that data available to you for presentation at the board level. Um, and so I think from that perspective, you know, we definitely felt like there is significant like alignment between his messaging and the company's messaging. Um, he's definitely lending us his credibility when it comes to like why um, the numbers and the metrics generated out of our tool is very important at the board level. Um, and then also, you know, I think he felt really good about helping us solidify that messaging and really felt like the buy-in um, at the board level. So just some additional ways of engaging with the board. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, just a quick reminder for all the folks listening, you know, feel free to ask questions or, you know, pepper in some questions. I'm happy to uh, make sure our panelists answer this by the end. Uh, so, you know, keep them coming or at least or br br bring them some questions. Um, Brian, you know, as, as Sha was talking through this, is like, you know, one of the things that I always wonder is that, you know, can executives of the company have relationship with the board uh, independent of the CEO? Or does a CEO need to always be in these conversations? You know, like what information that you can share that the CEO knows versus not? Like, I'm curious, like any, you know, any advice on how to navigate? Because it's, it's a delicate relationship. Yeah, for sure. Well, I would say um, uh, that there's a lot of value that can be had by establishing direct relationships with board members. Because in a board, uh, there's going to be a number of people. There's there's naturally going to be uh, probably one or two of those people who are the most interested and knowledgeable about engineering, right? Like there's probably going to be some personas on the board that might be sales focused kind of people, right? Or or other profiles that they're they're not really necessarily going to be able to dig in and understand um, at the same level as if you have board members who maybe have that product background or an engineering background or that operator background. And those are the people who I think you're going to be able to get the most help from as a technology executive. Um, and then in order to get the most out of those relationships, if you can be in a situation where you can, you know, feel comfortable shooting off an email or even shooting off a text message to, to somebody who's in that um, seat uh, about what's going on in your technology organization, that can be uh, a really good way to increase the ROI of that reporting that you're doing, right? You're, you're sort of building the understanding, investing in so that you can get benefit back out of it. Um, I would say, you know, absolutely make sure that your CEO is comfortable with you communicating with your uh, board without the CEO necessarily being uh, in the loop. Um, but if there is a healthy relationship with uh, the board of directors and the company and they're the right people that are on there, then um, then that is probably a benefit to your CEO as well, because your CEO is probably busy and they don't they can't be in every loop anyway. And they want things to just, you know, no, nothing makes a CEO happier when they just find out that something was fixed or improved and they didn't even know that it was being fixed or improved until after it's done. Um, so I, I think that that can be um, very useful. Uh, if you're not sure who, talk to your CEO. And, and one of the things that we're doing at Code Climate um, that I'm working on is, is sort of helping to set up each of my executives 
with a kind of like a buddy uh, on the board, right? So that they know that, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is like the, the first first person I'll call um, when I need that additional perspective or uh, uh, help with a relationship or, or network or something like that, um, just to kind of be an extra level of encouragement for people to develop those relationships. And that's something that we're doing now kind of at the um, series uh, C stage as the executive team gets a little bit bigger and the board is a little bit bigger. All right, um, Shaw, this is, you know, as I think about, like, I love the fact that, you know, the board gets to sort of zoom out and look at the company from outside in, because I think you just look at different things, right? When you're in the bits and bytes of every day, there, there are things you miss, right? So it's sort of always the forest for the trees. Uh, and one of the things that I think a lot about is like, like DNI, right? Is like, and what is sort of like the board's involvement in the company's DNI posture, right? Whether it's recruiting, whether it's you know people, you know whether it's the product that you're building. I'm curious, it you know actually not just you, Sha, you and Brian. Like, do you see do you see a role of the board in helping improve the DNI posture of a company? And just would love to hear examples when you've seen that come through. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think, you know, um, Brian touched on this as well, is that when you're presenting data and numbers to the board, think about kind of um, what story you're trying to tell, right? So it's not just about, you know, we hired this many engineers, but um, for example, um, as we kind of looked at our company growth or spe specifically our engineering team growth, um, it was about kind of how we up level people, right? So how many promotions did we have from within? How many, um, you know, um, uh, staff levels that we hire from externally. Um, what's the mix, right? And so DNI in terms of like how do we um, look across like um, our team and representation in terms of like you know underrepresented minorities, women in tech, um, you know uh, people of different age ranges, right? So like kind of like do we have different perspectives and have we made that better over time? Um, one of our investors, um, Workbench, uh, who invested in us at the seed stage, um, they're also a very um, well known for their community building um, in New York. Um, so I'm sure Brian is familiar with some of the, the Workbench events, but um, they, they often have like women in sales, women in enterprise, um, women in tech events, um, where they try to bring the community together. So that's also helped us play a, hu uh, play a huge role in kind of just getting the word out um, and creating a community. Um, around um, you know underrepresentation in tech um, and to kind of help you know say hey we have really um, you know welcoming environments and friendly networks and communities that we're trying to build around this and so that's part of the philosophy that we also built as a company too so like for catalyst for example because we're focused on kind of customer success um, as a career path as a discipline um, we have um, you know Diana who's kind of um, on the marketing side to kind of talk about how to use CS as a path into tech, um, you know, for people who want to kind of get into tech, um, as well as we have coaching corners um, and communities. So it's where we map um, kind of, you know, well-established and well-known CS leaders with people who are more earlier in their career looking for help. So those are just some of the things that we're doing um, across the board to kind of build community and tap into um, our investors community when it comes to hiring and recruiting. Okay. Yeah, that's great shot. And just to add on a, a couple things that I've seen, I think, you know, the the sort of the best investors have taken a more proactive approach in helping their portfolio companies in these types of areas, I think, over the past, you know, five or so years than from perhaps before that. Um, and so uh, now it's it's commonplace for investors to want to be able to sort of understand data around these types of initiatives in their organizations, um, and they can help with a few, in a few different sort of clear direct areas. One is just benchmarking and understanding, right? So um, as a, a startup, you know you have great access, hopefully great access to data, what's going on in your organization, but less access to data into what's going on into other organizations, and it can be hard. In in uh, many areas, just get a feel for like, hey, are we doing well? Are we not doing well? You know, you can type keywords into Google and try to pull up blog posts from, you know, about different uh, uh, metrics and you get something from 1997 that says, you know, hey, this was the, you know, this was great stats in this area, but of course the world has changed. Um, so that perspective is useful. Uh, and then the two others uh, are, I would say basically, um, 
helping advise on what has worked for other portfolio companies to achieve their goals um, and just being able to you know sort of crib best practices and ideas hey that's actually something that we could totally do we just didn't think of it right but but it may be a sibling portfolio company did workbench has uh, does have a bunch of stuff going on in the city um, Union Square Ventures, which was our Series A investor, is is similar. They always have um, uh, sort of events in person and digital going on to, to help kind of get these people together. And then the last piece I would add is just sometimes investors are able to directly assist the portfolio companies with programs that would otherwise not be able to to sort of be done at that scale right so at the fang scale there's people in those organizations who can do like all sorts of you know programs and projects and initiatives uh, because the organizations are that large but you know at at our scale um, we don't have dedicated individuals to, to sort of take on each of those things that we'd love to be able to have them take on just because you know, our headcount is about 100 and we're not we're not there yet. So um, Union Square Ventures, for example, they help facilitate uh, management training programs. Um, and so we're able to uh, take individuals at Code Climate who are future leaders in the organization or maybe new lead, you know, new managers in the organization and actually have them go through structured kind of management training boot camp type programs that would be a little bit difficult in terms of scale or, or cost for us to kind of support on our own, but they bring together people from different portfolio companies and they complete that training together. Um, so I would definitely say as a technology executive in your organization, you should uh, make sure you have a firm understanding of what the resources, programs and, and assistance um, that your investment firms uh, sort of offer because many of them have people dedicated inside of their organizations really to run things for the for portfolio companies. But I've seen in the past, sometimes people just aren't aware of what's available to them because maybe there's not even a person in the org yet to, to tell you what's what's available. Um, so it, it's um, it's definitely something that's that's uh, uh, worth looking into. Great. Well, we're, you know, we're almost coming at time. So maybe I'll start, I'll, I'll end with one last question, right? We've talked a lot about, you know, how to work with the board and, you know, the, so they're obviously in the roles that you both are in, you naturally have reasons to work with the board. But, you know, there's definitely a trend in the industry where like, especially like, you know, VCs and investment firms are looking for technology operators to also be in other people's boards, right? Because, because it's a really important sort of insight, right? So, you know, if you if you were an operator and you were looking for opportunities to be on board, of, you know, either advisor or observer or be on the board, you know, any advice on how, how people could find these opportunities? And I'll start with you, Shah, if you've had experience with that, and then Brian. Yeah, so actually, uh, just, uh, you know, our investors are invest, invest uh, in a variety of companies, right? And so just as uh, in that we're asking them for help for intros, uh, tapping into their network to kind of get our word out. They're also kind of looking out for their other portfolio companies. Um, a lot of our investors happen to invest in SaaS businesses, um, especially in tech. So as a, you know, kind of a technology leader, or as an engineering leader, um, sometimes uh, I get tapped a lot by our earlier stage investors like, hey, we have a portfolio company that does this. Um, would this be a helpful product for you? And would you be willing to try, try them out as a design partner? Um, so essentially kind of, um, you know, give them feedback um, and they won't charge you, but kind of just kind of between the portfolio companies, would you be willing to try them out and give them feedback? So I think that's actually a really great way um, to both kind of give back um, in this board relationship um, in terms of like, hey, you know, not just, you know, we're asking you to intro um, to other portfolio companies, but we're also helping you evaluate um, some of these portfolio companies. Um, and I think from a tech leader perspective, this has also helped me kind of stay on top of the latest trends in technology in terms of like, hey, you know, what are investors uh, investing in these days? Um, what are some of the up and coming um, startups? Like what are some of the things that people are doing that's really cool? And so as a tech leader, I feel like it's also helping me stay up to date in terms of like where people are investing in and where are some of the trends in technology, so. Cool, um, Brian, any advice from you? Uh, I'll just do a quick plug, uh, which is um, for a company called Bolster, uh, which I'm not affiliated with. I'm well, a small investor, but uh, my friend Matt uh, is the CEO there, and they help connect executives with opportunities for being mentors, uh, fractional uh, contributors to other portfolio companies, and also board members. I know they do a bunch of 
uh, board searches for uh, companies that are looking to add independent board directors. Um, so you can go on there and create a profile and um, sort of be a target uh, for those searches for potentially um, joining as an independent director. Great. And, and you know, there's definitely lots of uh, opportunities, lots of, I think, uh, agencies that are helping with that, like this first first board, there's Athena Alliance, right? There's lots of, you know, I would say it's like your network is probably where your first board opportunity is going to come from, right? So lean heavily into it. But there's also other avenues out there that can prep you for your first board meeting or your first board interview. Uh, with that, I think we're getting pretty close to being done here. Um, there are a couple of questions, and especially around engineering KPIs, that might be best uh, answered in Slack because engineers love to talk about KPIs, <laughs> and I think I think it's a much better documented conversation there. Well, I want to thank both you, Shaw and Brian, for your time. Super valuable, super helpful. Hopefully, the our live participants also enjoyed this conversation. And then we will see you on the Slack channel for more questions.